Hey, everybody, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, it's really great to have this opportunity to be up here with you on this stage. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the day I met Hamilton, which is kind of a crazy story. I was, uh, I, I was traveling extended in South America, and I had a bunch of different psychedelic experiences. And one of those that really stood out was I, I did San Pedro with this shaman named Luis in the Sacred Valley. And uh, when I got back home, I was invited to a cactus fundraiser by, by Jade, who's actually back there in the audience, same person who seems to connect everyone in this space. And uh, I show up at this cactus fundraiser, and the first thing that I see is there's this giant painting, and this is what's being auctioned off for the, for the fundraiser. And it's of this shaman Luis that I just sat with in, in South America that I had no idea had any ties or connections to anyone I knew. So that was crazy. And then, and then Hamilton was there. And, uh, and at the time, I was a very big fan. And, and I didn't want to make it known that I was a fan. So I was just like, OK, I'm not going to talk to Hamilton. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and my, she was my girlfriend at the time. She's my fiance now. She was like, OK, I'm just going to go up and, and, and talk to him. And uh, <laughs> she was like. <laughs> Just like, my, my boyfriend loves drugs and science. You guys should talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we talked, and, and uh, I'm, I'm still a big fan of Hamilton. Uh, I listen to his podcast, subscribe to his podcast, which you guys all should too. And uh, I also consider him a friend. So well, thank, thank you. you all for coming. <laughs> all right. Uh, Hamilton, I know you're many things documentarian, historian podcaster, psychonaut, consultant, but first and foremost, I think of you as a chemist. Uh, what is it about chemistry that you love? Well, I think making drugs is extremely fun. And <laughs> I mean, it, 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 really, it really is. And I feel, I wish more people could do it. I think that, it, you know, it's like, it's kind of sad that in some parts of the world, like I've seen in Canada and Oakland, there are community labs where people can experiment with chemistry and see how beautiful it is because it's really something that most people never get to experience. You know, maybe you've made something like uh, in carpentry or something like that. It's sort of like that. You get to build something slowly and there's all these little puzzles that you solve and then you have to figure out if it actually worked. But the whole process is immensely satisfying. And uh, I feel like most people, if they had the opportunity to try it, would also get a kick out of it. So, I mean, if you ever get a chance, try it making a drug, ideally, <laughs> without, um, you know, getting in legal trouble. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so I kind of, the, the, the kind of, like, trending theme, I think, throughout tonight will be a bit about misconceptions and just some misconceptions that we see in the space or identify in the space and, and I know that's also a topic that you also enjoy to speak about as well. So I think we can talk about that tonight. Um, and since we started with the chemistry question, uh, I want to talk a little bit about a ke a ketamine and stereochemistry. Um, at the development of Spravato, there's been a lot of just new interest in what, what's, 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 what's an R in any mirror, what's an S in any mirror, what does that mean? I also recently saw someone sent me and showed me this drug menu that had on it um, different blends of R and S and said this one's more R and it, it does this and, and you could also purchase R ketamine and I just want to talk about maybe you could start with basics on stereochemistry and what the difference are between enamors and then get into the reality of that drug menu. Yeah yeah so a lot of drugs have what's called a chiral center, and that creates mirror images of the drug. So ketamine is one example, it has one chiral center. Um, some drugs don't, for example, mescaline doesn't, uh, LSD has two chiral centers, 
um, DMT has none. So it just sort of depends on the drug. But what is often the case is that if you have one of these chiral centers, it changes the three-dimensional conformation of the drug and the way that it interacts with receptors in the brain. So it's often the case that in these two mirror image molecules, which are called enantiomers, one of them will be different than the other one. And in ketamine, that has become a bit of a, a meme, both in the underground and even in the pharmaceutical realm. So in the United States, the form of ketamine that has traditionally been used as an anesthetic is the racemic preparation, meaning it's a 50-50 combination of these two stereoisomers, R-ketamine and S-ketamine. And then when the Spravato product was being put through clinical trials, they sort of modified it and they isolated one enantiomer, one of these uh, forms, three-dimensional forms of the ketamine molecule, which is called the S enantiomer, which is the more potent enantiomer. And there was a kind of debate about this at the time, whether this was just some kind of, uh, you know, pharmaceutical gaming company gaming the system in order to have exclusivity on a drug that otherwise would be much cheaper. That was kind of the common interpretation of what was going on. People would say, oh, well, ketamine, racemic ketamine is very, very cheap, and this Johnson & Johnson Spravato product is very expensive. Clearly, they're just doing this for profit. And that was probably part of it. But there were also justifications for using the S enantiomer. It's much more potent than the racemic preparation, almost twice the potency. Um, it's metabolized more quickly. And ketamine has some degree of toxicity in the bladder. and it seems that it's dose dependent. So by exposing the patient to a smaller quantity of ketamine, it could hypothetically reduce the toxicity, although that hasn't really been demonstrated. It hasn't been sufficiently studied. So that was what was happening in the pharmaceutical sphere. And it started to kind of leak out onto the street where people started saying that street ketamine was either R or S enantiomer. And as far as I can tell, nobody is testing this. This is not based on any kind of evidence. In order to uh, assess whether something is enantiomerically pure, you need to use typically an instrument called a polarimeter that I have never seen anyone using to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to assess the stereochemistry of what they're consuming. But there was a kind of like, yeah, folk pharmacology where if they tried ketamine and it was especially uh, dissociative, they might say, oh yeah, this is S. And if it were milder, they might say, oh yeah, this is R. And you know, it could be anything. It's not even necessarily ketamine. And I even, uh, like, I mean, it's, it's not, yeah. And uh, I even had someone, um, you know, approach me at a, a conference recently, and they, they said, you know, I've got this sample of this ketamine, and there's something different about it. It's absolutely extraordinary. It has these properties that no other ketamine has ever had before. I've given it to my friends. They all agree there's something completely different about this. I think it's ketamine combined with mescaline because it's so visionary. And so we, we talked, and I helped him organize an analysis of the sample, and it was just good old-fashioned ketamine. So, so I, I think that uh, what, uh, you know, it was, yeah, so, and I, he was blown away. You know, he was saying, like, well, how, I, how, how do you explain these experiences that I've had? Well, ketamine is already capable of producing amazing experiences, but uh, I think people also neglect to recognize the psychological contributions of taking any of these drugs. They, as soon as they have a, a dramatic experience, they think, oh, it must be a different drug as opposed to maybe I'm more open to the experience or maybe something about my psychology at this given time is making the experience more interesting or has more depth or whatever. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the, the RS ketamine thing. And, yep. and one reason that it's especially weird is that separating the enantiomers is not trivial. It's not something that's uh, happening in clandestine labs. In fact, there is essentially no clandestine ketamine synthesis. Any ketamine that people are using is diverted from uh, like bulk pharmaceutical manufacturing supply chains in India and China. Yeah. Yep. Or, for, or pharmaceutical material in Mexico, but yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Great. That's yeah. the answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, let's uh, jump into neuroscience a bit. Um, what is the default mode network, and how has this become a talking point for the benefits of a psychedelic experience, and, and just how based in reality is that? <laughs> 
Yeah. So I think, you know, people have these amazing experiences with psychedelics and then the logical next question is, well, what just happened and how did it happen and how can this be scientifically explained? And there's been this uh, tremendous appetite for some type of explanation for the psychedelic experience. And Robin Carhart Harris at Imperial College was doing a lot of neuroimaging work where he was looking at the default mode network at the same time that Michael Pollan was writing How to Change Your Mind. And he chose Robin Carhart Harris's work to be kind of the uh, default explanation for how psychedelics exert their effect. And I think that it's maybe uh, at best a little bit reductionist and maybe entirely wrong, time will tell. But, um, but I think whether or not the default mode network is the best explanation or some kind of disruption of the default mode network is the best explanation for how psychedelics exert their effect is kind of... Um, it's like one of a long lineage of different reductionist explanations for how psychedelics do what they do, which is not to say that they don't have some kind of uh, material mechanism in the brain that is responsible for the effect. I think it's it's just that people um, are too eager to find some kind of simplistic explanation. And this is, you know, the default mode network is not the only thing at play here. It goes on and on and on. I think we're maybe going to talk about the other... Yeah, I, I guess it's all within the same realm of things. So it's just it's connectivity, canalization, spinogenesis. They're all kind of. I guess what we can touch upon, I think maybe a bit more, is is, is neuroplasticity, because once again, that's like another term that everyone talks about, and and as as like the the end all for the benefit of psychedelic experience. And just talk a little about, you know, is is neuroplasticity always a good thing, uh, and and just what does that term mean? Right, right. So then, yeah, this is, a, so now there's all this emphasis on, you know, synaptic or dendritic remodeling, spinogenesis. Um, there was a paper that just came out this month on track B and how that is going to explain the activity of, of psychedelics through some kind of uh, BDNF mediated mechanism. And this is, again, this goes on and on and on. I'm not saying that these aren't potentially playing a role, but like once you follow this literature for a while, it starts to feel like every month there's a new thing that explains why ketamine or LSD or psilocybin exerts its effect. And it, it starts to become uh, a little bit less persuasive when you see this massive proliferation of different explanatory models. And scientists need these things in order to study. Like there, there's a reason that uh, these things generate scientific publications because they can be studied. You can look at uh, dendritic spines and you can measure them and you can say, look, there's more after ketamine and look at the you know, affinity at the track B receptor and look at uh, the release of BDNF. But um, you know, some exceptions to that might be the fact that there have been drugs in clinical development like NSI 189 that uh, induced neurogenesis, especially in the hippocampus, they released neurotrophic factors and failed miserably as antidepressants. And also in the realm of treatment of Parkinson's disease, there's been a direct infusion of GDNF into the brain. And so that, you know, that's like about as, as simple as it gets, just pumping it directly into the brain. And not only did it uh, not seem to reverse the progression of Parkinson's. Um, and I don't believe it had much of a, you know, antidepressant type effect either. Not that that was what they were studying at the time. So th it's not to say that these things don't play a role. I just think it's always important whenever the the fashionable new uh, biochemical or neuroscientific explanation of psychedelic action hits the press to keep in mind the long lineage of these different explanations and how it's usually not one thing. It's like a, it's a, um, it's a probably a combination of different factors. And, and this is one reason that I've always really admired the work of Alexander Shulgin is he placed very little emphasis on, even though he was trained as a biochemist, he placed very little emphasis on any kind of neuroscientific or biochemical interactions with psychedelics. For him, it was chemistry and then experience. And the bridge between those two was something that he just didn't really concern himself with all that much. And I think that for him, that was an extremely wise position to take because if he had been engaging in the 
models that were used during the time that he was doing this research in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and to a lesser extent the 90s, a lot of his work would be obsolete. But because he focused on the chemistry, which is timeless, and the experience, which is also timeless, um, that was that's ultimately what really matters, is does it make you feel better? Does it make you feel good? Does it uh, help you reflect on your own existence in a way that is constructive? I think that's much more important than some interaction with track B or whatever. It's true. Back to the chemistry. Yeah. Um, I, I recently was sent, uh, I, I think it's like going to be the new hot narrative, which is a critical period reopening of the social reward learning pathway. And it's, it's, it's like reading this paper, it seems kind of cool and pretty compelling. But I think that like, it's important to start looking at these things as more of a systems approach rather than these individual pieces. I, I recently read a term called like uh, metaplasticity, which is kind of seeing it more as a systems approach. I thought it was pretty cool. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's this one was just talking about that. All right. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, limitations in, in in researching psychoactive chemicals. Um, and maybe we can touch upon MDMA. Uh, ben Sessa had a study that was labeled debunking the myth of the Blue Mondays, which was you know, a surprising positive result, but it, it doesn't really align with a lot of people's experiences. Um, what's your take on the discrepancy here? And uh, you know, what are some repercussions of the media writing about that topic and putting it out there? Yeah, so I think that that paper speaks to a kind of overarching issue that people have felt for so long that these drugs have been mischaracterized in one way or another, that their benefits haven't been sufficiently appreciated by the public, that they're very eager to show, no, it's not what you thought. They're actually really good and you think that it's toxic, but it's not. And you think that it makes you feel bad the next day, but it doesn't. And you know, I saw a lot of this in the cannabis community when cannabis was uh, really becoming part of the mainstream. There was kind of this need to make cannabis exclusively good and say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't cause lung cancer and it's, you know, it's not bad to smoke it. Well, of course it's not good to smoke anything and it is associated with emphysema. And what made me uncomfortable about that was you know, cannabis is amazing, it's very good, but you don't need to say that it has no negative effects whatsoever in order to appreciate that it has positive effects. And if people go too far in their zeal to demonstrate that these things are good, it can cause a, a backlash. So the Ben Sessa paper, uh, I think, was, was maybe a little bit in that direction uh, because there is evidence that people do sometimes experience a come down or uh, some kind of depression of mood in the wake of an MDMA experience, both clinically and anecdotally. That's not to say that this uh, negates the benefits of MDMA. It absolutely doesn't. But if you go to the extreme and you say, oh, this is you know completely without toxicity, completely without any kind of detrimental effect on mood, then you're ultimately maybe not helping people. So it's not, like, the Ben Sessa paper is not a huge issue as far as I'm concerned. It's just a, a bigger, I'm talking about the bigger concern that, and I experience this as well. Like, if you really care about something, uh, you, you want people to know that it's good. You want to say, oh, you know, all that stuff you heard about MDMA, well, that's street MDMA. This is clinical MDMA. This is pure MDMA. It's totally different than what you thought. And it doesn't have any of those things that you read about in the tabloids. I get, I get it. But it's just, I think it's important to be very careful with that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, no, there, yeah. there, there will be repercussions if yeah. you just put it out there that there aren't any issues or any concerns. Yeah. Sense. Okay. Uh, now I want to talk a bit about the drug development process, something that I think you've become a bit more familiar with lately, um, with working, consulting for Compass. What are the different types of patents that drug companies use, and why are patents important in the drug development process? I mean, the, the basic calculation is that it costs money to run a lab and to make drugs. And so if you're going to fund the development of a drug, which could cost millions of dollars, you need, in most instances, unless you're operating in a purely philanthropic framework where you have billionaires that are just donating money to... Uh, you know, for the benefit of humanity, which would be really nice, but it's sort of a, uh, uh, a difficult model for everyone to use to develop medicines. Mm -hmm. um, so, th so the typical situation is you 
provide a lab, a research facility with money to make drugs, and if they invent something that has therapeutic utility of one kind or another, you patent it for some therapeutic application, and then this provides a, a period of exclusivity where the people who funded the development of the drug can push it through clinical trials and market it for a period. And the system is certainly not without flaws. I mean, our whole medical system is insane and, and uh, impossibly complicated. But I think that sometimes patenting gets a little bit too much emphasis. I mean, you know, like the, the two drugs that I think like the public are most aware of in terms of like pharmaceutical price gouging, insulin and Daraprim, both of these drugs are off patent. So like this is just an example of how you, patents don't necessarily need to mediate pharmaceutical greed. There's all kinds of other ways that th these things can happen. Um, and it's a, it's a much more complicated equation than I think most people recognize. And there are other frameworks. Um, there's all sorts of different ways things could be, but they all have their own costs and benefits. Like, um, you know, in New Zealand, they did something really interesting that doesn't get talked about very much, where they basically allowed people to make drugs without any medical pretense whatsoever. And they had to put them through a sort of phase one toxicology test. And then they could be sold to adults to get high. I mean, do people know about this? Yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so it wasn't, you know, we're, we're selling cannabinoids to treat headaches or anxiety disorder and insomnia or anything like that. It was totally explicit. This is for adults to smoke, to get high, and we have demonstrated that it doesn't exhibit hepatotoxicity or nephrotoxicity or whatever, so this is it. This is the plan. I thought that was a kind of brilliant... Oh, yeah. strategy, oh, yeah. but it's t it's relatively unregulated, and it requires a, a, a degree of social maturity that may not be present in our culture. So, I mean, that's like an example of an alternate framework, it, but it would involve deregulation, which I think would also make a lot of people uncomfortable, perhaps with reason. So, it's, you know, this, all this stuff is complicated. Got it. Yeah. So, I, I think the question everyone wants answered is, uh, did Compass Pathways patent hand-holding? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, they didn't patent hand-holding. But there was a patent application where hand-holding was discussed as, like, uh. part, of, as part of their uh, therapeutic plan. Yeah. yeah. But, but that became, like, a whole thing. It became it? a meme. I mean, I think it just speaks to this, uh, you know, the fears that people have, which are, you know, I'm not saying people shouldn't be concerned. It's good to be vigilant and aware of all this stuff. But... It's it kind of bothered me because a it's not real like it's not a you know it's just not like it's insane to assume that hand holding there would be like hand holding cops that would come and prevent anyone from holding hands while taking a psychedelic like it's just not real, um, but uh, but especially when all the psychedelics that are commonly used are Schedule One controlled substances, and if there's anything people should be concerned about, it is the DEA. So this is, like, I'm sometimes afraid that this fear distracts from bigger, more pressing issues that actually threaten to freedom, and instead we're kind of, like, talking about these imaginary concerns. But at the same time, it's a kind of disgusting. I want to talk a bit about uh, you know, this oversight within the psychedelic space, and, and not only in the drug development side, but also in the underground and, and a lot of these companies that are developing for direct to consumer, uh, the importance of oversight there. I, I just want to kind of read this quote that I saw posted on the board for the MAPS 2023 conference, and it says, too long having been sold a bill of goods that is deleterious for longevity and quality of life by the government and its pharmaceutical puppeteers. It is an honor to offer something that we believe is an actual tool that can be used to optimize one's life and bring balance to an otherwise typical church. Signed, the Church of the Sacred Synthesis, which is formerly known as the Church of Silent Knights. Um, I wonder if we could just talk about the Church of Silent Knights and, uh, and, and what happened there. And, and you all know the story. It's pretty wild. It's a pretty good story. <laughs> Okay, so this this like has a whole background. Yeah. This is like kind of thing. Okay, but okay, so there's this mycologist named Yoshin Arts who wrote 
precursors to create new psychedelics. So the, what he did was he took um, DET, which is a psychedelic that is not found in nature, and he put it in the substrate that he was growing mushrooms on, and he found that they hydroxylated the pore position on the indole ring as if it were a psilocin or psilocybin derivative, but in so these mushrooms were growing, but they didn't produce psilocin or psilocybin, they produced more hydroxy DET. So they were mushrooms that were producing a otherwise completely synthetic chemical. It's a really cool paper. The work has not been duplicated. I don't know that anyone has seriously tried, but it became kind of a thing that everyone talked about, like, oh, wow, if you can do this with DET, what else can you do it with? And he had another paper where he did it with tryptamine, and he found that it dramatically increased the concentrations of psilocin in the mushrooms to something like, uh, it was, I think, pretty close to 4% dry weight, um, which is, yeah. Good morning. We, yeah. Oh, what is it? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, is it, that's I like kind of liked it better than the other Is that like a, a okay, well, ah, whatever, okay. Um, so, so those papers came out in the 80s, everyone, and then Gartz was arrested um, on, well, actually not unrelated to it, but that's another story. So anyway, so he didn't get to continue a lot of that work, but it became a thing that people talked about. Well, if, if he did this, what else could you do? Could you feed mushrooms different chemicals and could they convert it into the respective psilocin and psilocybin derivatives? And with 4-hydroxy DET, it was a cool uh, proof of concept, but that's something that can be produced synthetically. So the next question is, what about things that are really hard to synthesize? And a, a beautiful candidate for that was 5-methoxy-4-hydroxy DMT, because this is insanely difficult to synthesize. There's only one chemist who's ever pulled it off. It's chemist Mark Julia, who's like a, a pretty serious guy. And his, uh, his process was extremely laborious. So this group, I guess in Texas, uh, decided to dope the substrate with 5-MeO-DMT and then see if it would convert the 5-MeO-DMT to 4-hydroxy-5-MeO-DMT, which they called silomethoxin. Um, and it was a really cool idea. Everyone was excited about the possibility that it would work, myself included. And they sent me a sample to analyze uh, like a year ago, maybe, maybe a little more. And I analyzed it, and there was none of that in it at all. There was nothing in it. And uh, Wasn't there something in it? There, there may have been trace... Well, okay. Well, let's not even get into that. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. But but there was there, that's that's a separate. <laughs> okay, but but yeah. Well, there were, one of the samples actually yeah had another chemical entirely that I think may have been added to it. But that's like. But anyway. Um, <laughs> but um, but and certainly not five meo four hydroxy DMT. So they're selling this to lots and lots of people, and I you know reach out to the proprietor of this church and tell him that I did this analysis and that it isn't totally conclusive in that, you know, GCMS can be weird. If you don't have an analytical reference, sometimes things don't ionize. It's like, I didn't want to just say with absolute certainty that it wasn't there, but I used two different mass specs and it was not present on either of them. So it was definitely seemed to be the case that they were, they were misrepresenting their product and it became this huge thing. And now they're, um, they've been, oh, and then Alexander Sherwood at USONA did the analysis did the himself analysis, and published yeah. it and showed that it was fake and um, and that all these people had been having like placebo trips on <laughs> on on these mushrooms that not only didn't contain this chemical silomethoxin but also didn't really seem to contain anything and um, and uh, and then they got very bent out of shape about this and started accusing the chemist who wrote the paper of. Uh, doing it out of like loyalty to the USONA corporation and it, it turned into a big scandal. It's kind of, uh, it's a good story. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, yeah, I mean, there's that. more. You could, this, this story is pretty wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a many wild story. But yeah, I mean, like that's, I guess that's the whole point of it. It's that we need, and it was, I think it's good that USONA did write that paper and, and did take it to their own hands to do analysis like that. I think that there should be oversight of some of these claims within the space. Yeah, because who knows how far this would have gone without anyone analyzing the material. I mean, I'm aware of other stories like this. Like there was a shaman that contacted me years ago who had been conducting ceremonies with what he thought was a cactus extract. And, and he asked me to analyze it for him because he was suspicious that it was so potent that just a tiny, tiny bit of powder was enough because, you know, mescaline requires hundreds of milligrams in order to exert a psychedelic effect. So he knew there was something a little bit off and it was, uh, it was 5-MeO malt, 
just a really weird research chemical that somebody had been telling him was a cactus extract that he'd been giving to hundreds of people. So, yeah, yeah. So stuff like that happens, and this is you know this is part of a underground economy and underground community where there isn't a lot of access to analytical instruments and these things can get really out of hand. I mean, the nobody having access to a polarimeter is another issue. Like this whole RS ketamine thing would be uh, pretty easy to disentangle if people could just test their samples more easily. All right. Um, another very popular topic of discussion in the psychedelic space is indigenous reciprocity. And, and I think it's it's very important. It's very important to to give back to communities that have developed certain practices and specific practices, and and to you know, show the respect for where they came from. One of the things that does worry me, though, is that there seems to just be a, a blanket on all psychedelics, and, and and everyone wants to wrap them into the same bucket rather than re realizing that there's different indigenous practices and things that are put in place. One of the things that I keep coming across, and I'm coming across it more and more, is uh, people telling me about the indigenous history of 5-MeO-DMT. And, 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 and like we were just down in South America. It was brought up there. It was, it, you know, there's, there's a, a pretty well-known shaman down there who says, you know, how, how it was talking about how it was used for, for however many years within all their communities down there. And I just, we need, I know this is a very long story, so I, I, I want to kind of do an abridged version of this, of just, just like smoking the Colorado River toad. Where, where did that come from? If you can do a short version of that, and then, and then talk about you know the importance of this, but also how we can separate those individual yeah, substances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the short version of the Bufo history is that there was a guy named Ken Nelson in Texas who read a paper by an Italian neuroscientist named Vittorio Spamer who had found different tryptamines in the venom of different toad species, and he saw that there was this one species, Bufo alvarius, that had really high concentrations of 5-MeO-DMT, and he knew that that was a psychedelic, and so he, he tracked it down and smoked the venom and is by as far as I know, as far as anybody knows, the first person to have done this and wrote a little book about it that described the entire process. And then it kind of disappeared into obscurity. The book was published in the 1980s and no one, you know, it was like a little bit of a thing that like people like Andrew Weil and Wade Davis were very interested in it, but it wasn't a big cultural phenomenon. And then these two Mexican physicians named uh, Octavio Reddick and Jerry Sandoval started traveling around and giving everybody 5-MeO-DMT containing toad venom. And part of their strategy, I mean, these people also, the stories behind them and are complicated and they're accused of, both of them are accused of all sorts of abuses. Um, but they would sort of create, they manufactured a sort of indigenous history of Bufu Alvarius use with the Seri people and Yaqui people. Um, and I think that also is an interesting phenomenon. This is not the first time it's happened. There was a sort of a manufactured indigenous use of 2CB among Kosa healers in South Africa as well. Um, and it, this kind of shows that it goes both ways. There's both uh, you know, use of indigenous knowledge. There's also use of indigenous people and the idea of indigenous knowledge to uh, try to legitimize things that have nothing to do with indigenous people. Because if something is perceived as having a tradition, then people find it more palatable for whatever reason. Um, yeah, and then in terms of like the broader indigenous reciprocity issue, I mean, it's it's just so complicated. I don't I don't think anybody has an answer to it, and I'm sort of uncomfortable with how often it's the conversation becomes like a non-indigenous person arguing with somebody who isn't really doing anything with indigenous knowledge. Like this happened to me recently, where someone who wasn't indigenous was saying like, "Well, what? How are you giving back?" And it's like, "Well, I'm I'm making new drugs that aren't really." Uh, related and like what is this like are, is this just a like are we just using indigenous people as like a tool to show who's more moral like does this actually have anything to do with helping indigenous people but um but yeah it's it's just like i don't think anyone has a, a really good answer and for what it's worth and like you know i've 
traveled around the world and I've spent time with a lot of different indigenous communities and the general attitude that I have encountered has not been one of extreme possessiveness. It hasn't been, you know, if you're going to, you know, take, we own mushrooms or we own iboga. If anything, I've experienced the opposite. Like I, when I was in Gabon, you know, they were very insistent on in giving me uh, iboga seeds under the condition that I propagate it in the United States. Like you have to grow this. You have to, <laughs> like, you, like you have to share this with other people. Um, and so I've, I've inca- that's not to say that they speak for you know everyone, obviously, but that is, in my personal experience, the attitude I have most typically encountered is is one of a desire to disseminate these things. And you know this is just a, a broader issue because, like the history of psychedelics is built on so many different people, indigenous people, people in the underground who risk their freedom to use these things, scientists who were working at a time before there was any kind of commercial application of their research. Like an example that nobody ever talks about is this guy, David Repke. I bet no, has anyone here heard of David Repke? So like no one has heard of this no. guy's name. He invented the process that every one of these companies that's making psilocybin is using. He was the first person to use 4-acetoxyindole and a speeder Anthony route to make psilocin derivatives. No one ever talks about him. That's the basis of Beckley SciTech, of Compass, of USONA. They're all using his route. Where's his uh, reciprocity? No one even talks about it. Like, so it's just, you know, it's like, this is kind of the, the reality of it, is that like we're building off of the sacrifices of all kinds of different people, and it's important to do whatever we can to acknowledge that and uh, you know be respectful. But I don't think anybody has the, a single answer to these concerns. Yeah. No, it's, it's definitely complicated. It's yeah. Complex. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Since we started with this, with the topic of uh, the Colorado River toad, um, want to also just touch on I know a topic that's also important to you, and, and it's it's. You know, it, the, sort of the debate of synthetic versus natural. I think maybe we just talk about some of the benefits of using synthetic in this case and in other cases, and and and, and yeah, just, that's it. The synthetic natural. It's a bit of the synthetic natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think a lot of people have spiritual associations with these substances, and they see natural things as being superior to synthetic things and that's uh not really a logical position but it's also that's fine you know people can believe whatever they want it really only becomes an issue when there's some kind of ecological consequence for preferring one thing over the other so in the case of peyote in the case of iboga in the case of bufo alvarius you have these plants that are potentially threatened by the increasing popularity of using them and in all three of those instances, there are synthetic replacements that would effectively negate the ecological consequences of using those things. So in those instances, I think it's really important to think carefully about the use, especially because this world is only growing. It's growing continuously, and it's already become a concern with aboga. It's already a concern with bufo alvarius, although there hasn't been adequate study of the population decline. Anecdotally, it does appear to be the case. Um, and with peyote, it's very, very well established that the populations are rapidly in decline. So it's just, uh, I think it's, it's a spiritual question, but one that has to be recognized in uh, light of the ecological consequences of one choice over another. Got it. Great. What's, uh, what's one recent interaction that's given you hope about the psychedelic sector in space? Oh, there's so many. I mean, I, I, I'm just happy that people are making new drugs. I think that's, like, uh, you know, really great. Like, when I was sort of first becoming interested in all this in the early 2000s, it was there, – there wasn't really all that much research. So, like, the research chemical world was all built off of the work of Shulgin and Nichols and David Repke and a few others. And in terms of new things being discovered, there were just barely any labs that were doing it at all. And so it was, like – when people talked about psychedelics, it was always this sort of past tense thing, like, oh, look at all this work that Sandoz did in the 1960s. And now it's happening again. Like, this is the proliferation of new chemicals that are occurring right now. I don't think it's rivaled by any other period in history. And we will look back to this as a amazing time for the discovery of new drugs. It's just the case that uh, a lot of it hasn't even been made public yet. 
like I published uh, along with uh, the chemists that I work with, we published maybe 200 new psychedelics in the last year. And wow. yeah, wow. yeah, and um, and you know that, but that's just the beginning, and yep. that's just one lab, and there's going to be many, many, many more. So that gives me hope because the more people that are looking into this stuff, the more weird, unexpected things that will be discovered. Like a lot of this is stems from serendipity, like the discovery that. It, Ibogaine has an anti-addictive effect. That was an accidental discovery. And, uh, and that's the case for so many of these things. So just more people engaging with this will inevitably result in more interesting discoveries being made. Okay. What's the perfect amount of LSD? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? It's, it's always the perfect amount. It's always the perfect amount. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Um, we're going to have time to open up for some questions, but uh, let's give a round of applause to Hamilton. And thank you for the good questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, the, the question was AI. AI in the psychedelic community and has it changed things or what do I predict is going to happen? Um, you know, there was a kind of like the biggest psychedelic AI guided project that I'm aware of was this uh, massive receptor modeling project by Brian Roth to, and where they screened... Uh, millions of virtual drugs at a virtual receptor in an effort to create a new psychedelic scaffold. And they had used this process successfully, very successfully with melatonin receptor agonists in the past. So I think everyone was really optimistic that the results for 5-HT2A agonists would be equally impressive. And I'm sure there's going to be more on this in the future, but at this juncture, the, it was sort of like a, a confirmationally constrained trip to me. And like it was pretty, it was like a, a seven as a uh, confirmationally constrained trip to me. And so it wasn't that crazy. Uh, I think people thought it was going to be something totally, totally new, and it wasn't. And, you know, I, this is something that I've seen with a lot of AI. Like, the, the people are, I think, a li have a slightly inflated idea. You know, I'm getting all these messages all the time where people, before they... Um, limited the sorts of questions you could ask on chat GPT that say, oh my God, chat GPT just created a new ketamine synthesis. What do you think? And it was just like total gobbledygook. But, but or I'll get these emails and they'll say like, oh, you know, this is going to change everything. Um, maybe. I hope it does. I, I mean, we can use all the help that we can get. But uh, I haven't seen anything yet that was totally mind-blowing. So I guess I'll just wait. Yeah, we'll just Definitely a lot of mice have taken them. Uh, they, <laughs> they cause a head twitch effect. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think this is one of the unfortunate difficulties as well, is that we don't have a good scientific infrastructure built for human self-experimentation uh, really anywhere in the world at the moment. And there's no shortage of people that would love to try these things, but the current standard is this very bureaucratic process where often millions of dollars have to be spent before a single human being can uh, actually consume a drug in a sanctioned manner. And that is really not the best way to go about this. I mean, Alexander Shulgin uh, was able to discover so many drugs using this very basic methodology where he would start at a low dose and gradually escalate and carefully monitor his response. And that worked really well for him. Um, have, I, would, have I tried that with two... Uh, well, let's let's not talk about that. But um, <laughs> but uh, but like the 
major way that these things are characterized in mice is with this thing, the head twitch response. And that's a, a pretty robust predictor for psychedelic activity in humans, as abstract as it sounds. I think it was, yeah, I mean, I, well, it kind of depends because there used to be a lot more self-experimentation. Like the history of so many of these drugs was built on self-experimentation far more than people realize. Like Ritalin, like the, the history of Ritalin is uh, the Italian chemist who discovered it, tried it, didn't think it was that great. Then he gave it to his wife, Rita, and she <laughs> took it and played tennis and it improved her tennis game. And he's like, oh, all right, I'll name it after you. It's Ritalin. Like that's the... <laughs> Like that's, that is like a, actually how it started. So, um, so uh, yeah, that used to be very common. Um, and again, it's just a question of, you know, safety, like all these things, regulation and safety and culture and how much risk people are willing to tolerate. And at this time, people seem to favor regulation and safety over the potential risks associated with uh, self-experimentation and most... Uh, industrial and academic contexts. Right here. Um, you mentioned that this concept of how the medicine just sees the person who is taking it. And I just wonder if there's much energy being put into researching and writing about the human beings that take in the chemicals on that side of things and the variance of humans and how it affects them. Is that something that's happening in the world of research, or is that something you write about? I mean, it, it is part of the clinical process is, you know, when people talk about something exerting an antidepressant effect, that's usually being measured by all these rating scales that they administer. And so, and those, and they, you know, do an intake where they evaluate the person's psychology and what sorts of disorders they might have. And so all this is integrated into it in a, in a very uh, regimented way. But in terms of the like broader understanding, I feel like that is something that more often exists in the realm of art and literature than in science, which is another thing that I think is sort of unfortunate when you look at uh, older scientific publications, it wasn't uncommon for there to be a sort of narrative component where people would describe the experience of consuming a drug. Like if you look at the early Stephen Sara DMT publications and DET publications, it's little excerpts of people describing their experiences with the drugs, which are similar to the sorts of excerpts in P Call and T Call that Alexander Shulgin published. And I think that's very useful because it, it gives you a, a kind of a better understanding of how a human being responds than uh, numbers on a rating scale or something like that. Yeah, I am familiar with it. Yeah. 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 He's talking about this dihydroxyflavone, which is uh, associated with some of these uh, neurogenesis and neurotrophic factor releasing effects that are being investigated as a potential mechanism for the antidepressant effect of psychedelics. And um, yeah, I've seen that literature. I haven't tried it. I don't know. Uh, have you tried it? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. It just depends on where you are. I mean, you know, the main thing is you don't want to get in legal trouble for what you're doing. So pursuing something that is, and there are legal chemistry things, it, like there are legitimate regulations concerning the use of volatile solvents in, in a domestic space. Um, so that's another thing to consider. There's, like, there's real fire hazards and real inhalation risks that need to be considered so you have to find a place to do it safely and ideally find something that is not going to result in you losing your freedom yeah so yeah yeah <laughs> i mean 
I have a question. Uh, I want to back up a little bit away from the science. Um, can you make a recommendation when we look at the industry right now, a lot of it is hype. And there's so much information around the media loves it. Everybody talks about psychedelics being the, you know, the bullet, the silver bullet for everything. Um, can you address that and also maybe talk about where can you get good information at this point? What do you think is reliable and where can people go if they want to know more? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is typical for media depictions of anything is you have these cycles of hype and anti-hype that reflect off one another where first people will talk about psilocybin or ketamine as the, you know, silver bullet that will cure society's ills. Then someone will write a hand-wringing piece about what are we going to do about all these ketamine telemedicine companies? Aren't too many people able to access ketamine now? And it goes back and forth endlessly. And... Um, I think both polls are something to regard with an understanding that journalists need to have a sort of take on something when often there isn't really a single answer to any of these things. Like, I, I don't know whether I think it's... I, start, I mean, I'm pretty liberal on all this stuff. Like, I, I think people should have access to whatever they want, so I'm not really the type to say, like, oh, we need to crack down on access to ketamine or something like that. But... Uh,